welcome. Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. Some things are not obvious. Science, just like the rest of us, has had to learn some things the hard way. This was certainly the case with mechanical fatigue. If one wants to determine exactly how strong something is, all they have to do is apply an increasing force or mechanical load until a sample of the material of interest breaks. Test hundreds of samples of material this way, calculate an average value, and design something with a safe tolerance around that established level of strength. Sounds easy, right? How strong a material is should be obvious. It should be straightforward. Do the tests, break some test samples, get the data, and get to work building. Sounds simple. My bet is the insightful Vanadium viewers are already sensing another shoe is about to drop. Turns out, it's not so simple. Reality is often more complicated than humans can plan for or even imagine in some cases. This is indeed true, even in the simplest case of the mechanical strength of metals and plastics. In some circumstances, materials can break under stresses far smaller than what they can normally withstand. It sounds counterintuitive, for example, one of my favorite alloys, titanium grade number 5, 6AL-4V, meaning 6% aluminum and 4% vanadium, has a tensile strength of just under 1,000 megapascals, or about 140,000 pounds per square inch. That means that a half-inch titanium cable could support something that weighs 100,000 pounds with no trouble. And that is completely correct. If one were to fabricate such a cable, and hang a 100,000 pound weight, the titanium alloy would stand its ground. But what happens if the 100,000 pound test load is cycled, applied, relaxed, and applied again? After a few rounds of this, it's a very different story. A wire cable capable of supporting 100,000 pounds may begin to yield under just a 50,000 pound load. It all depends on the history of the structure. The material has a memory. In practice, the number of cyclic repetitions is in the hundreds of thousands or millions before failure due to mechanical fatigue becomes an issue. This is why this phenomenon snuck up on engineers. One would have to be looking for metal fatigue in order to observe it. People had been building and working with metals for centuries before 1837 when the first scientific article on metal fatigue was published. Wilhelm Albert was the first person to observe and report the effect. He wasn't a scientist, but actually a mining administrator who was curious and investigating a series of mysterious failures of mine hoist chains. Working on a hunch, he designed and built his own test system for applying mechanical loads to chains repeatedly for up to 100,000 cycles. After applying and relaxing relatively small stresses to the chains, he noticed something. Albert was the first person to record the observation that metals appear to get tired. This was before the days of high resolution optical or electron microscopy, so we could only guess what was happening inside the microstructure of the material. Wilhelm Albert couldn't come up with a full explanation. Word of metal alloys getting tired didn't spread very far outside of a small group in the metallurgy community. On the 8th of May, 1842, a train crashed on the railway between Versailles and Paris, France. The train derailed after the leading locomotive broke an axle. The carriages behind all piled into it and caught fire. It was the first French railway accident and the deadliest in the world at the time, causing 200 deaths. The scale of the Versailles crash did bring some attention to what might be happening to the locomotive axles. Metal fatigue was still basically unknown at the time and the accident finally led to systematic research into the problem. There is an early hero in the story of metal fatigue, a man with an identical surname to that of your intrepid vanadium host. William John Rankin was a Scottish mechanical engineer who also contributed to physics and mathematics. Rankin was the first engineer to recognize that the failure of the Versailles locomotive axle was caused by initiation and growth of brittle cracks. In other words, metal fatigue. Rankin was also a major contributor to the science of thermodynamics, focusing on the first of the three thermodynamic laws. 
He developed the Rankine scale, an equivalent to the Kelvin scale of temperature, but in degrees Fahrenheit rather than Celsius. Rankine developed a complete mathematical theory of the steam engine, and his engineering textbooks were used for many decades after publication. He wrote several hundred papers on science and engineering topics, and his interests were extremely varied, ranging from botany to even music theory. He was an enthusiastic amateur singer, a pianist, and a cellist who even composed his own humorous songs. I'm impressed. William John Rankin, maybe he's family, maybe not, but he definitely has a place on the Vanadium Wall of Heroes. After the Versailles crash and Rankin's investigation, engineers and scientists were starting to take note of the lurking dangers of metal fatigue. However, in some cases, it was too late. On the 15th of January, 1919, in the North End neighborhood of Boston, Massachusetts, a massive 50-foot tall storage tank filled with 2.3 million gallons of molasses burst and the resultant wave of hot liquid rushed through the streets at almost 40 miles an hour, killing 21 and injuring 150 people. The event became local folklore and residents claimed for decades afterwards that that area of Boston still smelled of molasses on hot summer days. Witnesses reported that they felt the ground shake and they heard a roar as the tank collapsed, a long rumble similar to the passing of an elevated train. Others reported a tremendous crashing, a deep growling, a thunderclap-like bang, and a sound like a machine gun as the rivets shot out of the tank. The wave of molasses was 25 feet or 8 meters high at its peak and moved at nearly 40 miles an hour. It contained sufficient force that nearby buildings were nearly swept off their foundations and crushed. The tank that failed wasn't very old, but it had been filled with hot molasses and emptied repeatedly during its short life. This thermal cycling resulted in fatigue, an effect that engineers were starting to learn to be afraid of. It was starting to seem like some materials weren't as strong as they were supposed to be. Scientists had some awareness, but it hadn't become common knowledge that a material contains a history of the stresses in its life, that materials have a memory. How strong a material is depends on the strength of the chemical bonds, but also on the cumulative damage and the defects and how they're distributed. The unseen damage adds up, and it can add up to an unexpected result. In material science, fatigue is the initiation and propagation of cracks in a material due to cyclic loading. Once a fatigue crack has initiated, it grows a small amount with each loading cycle, typically producing striations or lines on parts of the fractured surface. The crack will continue to grow until it reaches a critical size, resulting in complete fracture or catastrophic failure of the structure. The microstructure of a fatigue material looks like it's covered in cobwebs. As the world became more technological, there were more opportunities for this failure mechanism to strike. Northwest Airlines Flight 421 was a domestic passenger flight from Chicago to Minneapolis, and it crashed on August 1948. The Martin 202 aircraft suffered a structural failure in its left wing and crashed about 95 miles southeast of Minneapolis. A Civil Aeronautics Board investigation determined that the crash was caused by fatigue cracks in the wings of the aircraft. Repeated stress on the wings, nothing too much, but over time, microscopic damage just accumulated. Just a few years later, fatigue would strike again and again. Two de Havilland Comet passenger jets broke up in midair and crashed within a few months of each other in 1954. As a result, finally, large-scale industrial investigations were opened. Systematic tests were conducted on aircraft fuselages immersed and pressurized in giant water tanks. The failure was determined to be the result of metal fatigue caused by the repeated pressurization and depressurization of the Comet aircraft cabin. In addition, Investigators discovered that the stresses around the cabin windows were considerably higher than had been anticipated, particularly around sharp cornered cutouts, such as square windows. As a result, future jet airliners would feature windows with rounded corners, the purpose of the curve being to eliminate potential areas for stress concentration. This is a noticeable distinguishing feature on all modern aircraft, the rounded window. On August 14, 1968, 
a Sikorsky S-61 helicopter crashed outside the city of Compton, California. All 18 passengers and three crew members were killed. The aircraft was destroyed by impact and fire. According to the National Transportation Safety Board, the probable cause of the accident was fatigue failure. In the course of the investigation, the NTSB made the following findings. The aircraft gross weight and center of gravity were within limits. The crew members were all qualified for the flight. The yellow main rotor blade separated in flight, rendering the aircraft uncontrollable. Blade separation was due to fatigue failure of the spindle. The fatigue crack was a high cycle low stress type which propagated over a long period of time. It is believed that the crack was present at the last inspection of the part and no one knows why it went undetected. Material fatigue wasn't finished wreaking havoc. The Alexander Kaland was a Norwegian semi-submersible drilling rig that capsized in March 1980, killing 123 people. It was the worst disaster in Norwegian waters since World War II. A year later, in March 1981, the investigation report concluded that the rig collapsed due to fatigue crack in one of its six bracings, traced to just a small six millimeter weld. Fatigue isn't just a metals thing. It can happen to ceramics, plastics, even rubber. In the year 2000, there was a recall of six and a half million Firestone tires on Ford Explorers. The issue was fatigue crack growth, leading to separation of the tread from the tire. Even though fatigue was now common knowledge to scientists and engineers, it didn't mean it wouldn't claim any more victims. There was still a lot about the repeated stress on materials that science just didn't understand. The 2002 China Airlines Flight 611 disaster was due to disintegration in flight due to fatigue failure. The 2005 Chalk Ocean Airways Flight 101 lost its right wing due to fatigue failure brought out by inadequate maintenance practices. The 2009 Cyano Shusenskaya power station accident was due to metal fatigue of the turbine mountings. In 2017, Air France Flight 66 had an in-flight engine failure due to fatigue fracture in the turbofan hub. Science is a learning experience, and it's normal to fumble along the way. Still, it must have been shocking for engineers to see their airplanes suddenly fall out of the sky and their molasses tanks emptying into the Boston streets. Just when they thought they had it all figured out, nature brings another surprise. I'm starting to think that's what reality does best. It just loves to challenge our plans and cast doubt on our understanding. The universe is always making sure we're on our toes. Thank you very much. This was Chris Rankin with Vanadium. <laughs>